All right, this is Jed Match Super Tools. I'm Jason Lee. Thank you for being here with me tonight. Uh, this is my standard disclosure statement. I've uh, discussed this before. This basically means that I'm free to be as independent as I want to be in discussing all of these tools and companies. Uh, to review, this is the reason we use GEDmatch. There are a lot of important features and a lot of important advantages. And as we discuss the intermediate to advanced tools that are available at GEDmatch, I think um, we'll give examples of just about all of these reasons for using GEDmatch. And um, I want to go back to an analogy that I've made before. Um, we can think of the amount of DNA that we share with our matches as genetic distance. All of the DNA testing companies report genetic distance for each of your matches. It's very important information to look at. Um, you want to uh, know the, the centimorgan shared for each of your matches. Uh, matching segment details are genetic coordinates, and almost all of the DNA testing companies provide genetic coordinates to use with your genetic distance to learn more about your family history, to map, map out your genetic family history. Unfortunately, um, Ancestry is a glaring exception to this rule. Um, Ancestry DNA does not provide genetic coordinates to use with genetic distance to map out your family history. So if you're on Ancestry DNA and you're not on any of the other DNA testing websites, you certainly want to get on GEDmatch or one of the other websites so that you can access the genetic coordinates and learn more about your family history. I'll also emphasize this point that I've made before. Matching segment details help us to disprove hypotheses to disprove shared ancestor hints, and to disprove DNA circle connections. Of course, we're generally interested in, we're generally interested in um, proving as much as we can prove, but um, sometimes our hypotheses are wrong. Sometimes the shared ancestor, ancestor hints are pointing us in the wrong direction. Sometimes the DNA circle connections are actually misleading. And by analyzing matching segment details, we can get to the truth and we cut, can cut through the things that are incorrect and, and get to uh, the truth about our family history. And I've talked about these issues in many of my blog posts. Some examples are these uh, blog posts that I've linked in the PDF document that I've created from tonight's slide. So uh, feel free to check out those blog posts if you're interested in these issues. So again, I'll go back to a case that I discussed briefly in a previous presentation, and we'll build on that case to learn about the uh, intermediate to advanced tools at GEDmatch. Um, so this example is my cousin Danny. Um, he is um, one of my top matches. When I first signed up for 23andMe, he was on my first page of matches at 23andMe, and I also found him on GEDmatch. So it was clear that he was a serious researcher involved in multiple databases. Uh, 23andMe was reporting that uh, Danny was a 47 centimorgan match. GEDmatch was reporting a little bit more, 51 centimorgans. And um, after I contacted Danny, he uh, alerted me to the fact that he was on Ancestry, and there I was finding um, a 37 centimorgan match. So um, as I noted, I made contact with Danny. He was gracious in responding. He gave me access to his family tree to Ancestry. And unfortunately, initially, we were unable to find any shared connection that would explain our shared DNA. But he did uh, tell me that his mother might be testing at some point in the near future. Uh, however, with the information that we had at that time, we really couldn't um, find anything in common. And so uh, this is a slide showing um, a summary of information for Danny. In this case, it's showing uh, what he shares with my sister. So 37.4 centimorgans, high confidence match in the fourth to sixth cousin range, 
but uh, no shared ancestry known at that point to explain the shared DNA. So not being able to find common ground, we moved on. I moved on to other research. I was busy with my family tree. I hadn't really done a lot of work on my family tree since I was a child, so there was a lot of work to do. And as I made progress with that research, eventually I got a DNA hint for Danny. So I made some corrections in my family tree, and uh, that ended up generating a DNA hint. Uh, these are now called shared ancestor hints. At the time, they were called DNA hints. So uh, that was certainly very interesting, very gratifying in the early stages of learning about DNA research and genetic genealogy. And as you'll see here, um, this is a connection through my direct maternal line, uh, Ruth Dean, my second great grandmother. Uh, for Danny, this is a maternal connection. I made some check marks there. Uh, we want to try to remember these two um, items. Remember that this for me is a connection through Ruth Dean, and for Danny, it's the connection through his mother. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. So in addition to the shared ancestor hints, a few days later, a couple weeks later, we ended up getting a DNA circle for this shared connection. So of course, this was very compelling, certainly for a new genetic genealogist. This is very persuasive information uh, to suggest that perhaps we have uh, verified our ancestral connection with this DNA information. Um, but I'm a little bit cautious, and so I would suggest, even though this is very persuasive and compelling information, we really want to look for more clues, if we can find them, to either build on what we know and to reinforce what we know and to provide more evidence to support what, what we've seen or to go in a different direction. So in this case, uh, we can look at the shared matches. We do have a good number of shared matches. Um, and so, uh, again, this is a predicted fourth to sixth cousin relationship, high confidence. We have a DNA circle for Emily Elizabeth Deloach, who was married to Will, uh, Wilson Williams. Um, and, and we get uh, 24 shared matches, 24 people who match Danny and my family. Uh, unfortunately, 13 of those shared matches have no family tree at all. And two of the people who have family trees have family trees with fewer than 10 people. So not all of these matches are going to help us very much. And in fact, uh, looking closely at each of the matches who do have good trees, there were no obvious Williams-Deloach connections. Remember, for me, this is a Williams-Deloach uh, family tree connection, and none of the shared matches had any Williams or Deloach connections uh, to substantiate what we had already found. So no additional shared ancestor hints were identified and really no clarification. This doesn't disprove uh, what we, we saw previously, but it's certainly something to think about. But um, at 23andMe, I did get some new Dean connections. Um, these were very interesting. And again, we're, we're focused on the Dean line because that's uh, my connection. Um, to, to Danny, and uh, in particular, I found a cousin, Victoria, on 23andMe, who was shown as sharing 78 centimorgans of DNA with Ruth Dean's niece, Katrina. So uh, I had already found um, a Dean connection in Katrina, who uh, shares 215 centimorgans with my family. And remember, Ruth Dean's my second great-grandmother, and Ruth Dean is Katrina's maternal aunt, and Victoria is shown as sharing um, a good amount of DNA with Katrina. So we've got some interesting uh, Dean connections here on 23andMe, and it would be nice to see if we can integrate this information with what we know about Danny. And so, of course, I reached out to Victoria, and I got a prompt reply, and the reply came from Danny. So I didn't see this coming, but Victoria is... Uh, Danny's mother, and so now things, the plot thickens even more. Um, for me, there's a, a new uh, Dean's William, uh, Dean, Dean Williams link, and for Danny, there's uh, uh, substantiation for the maternal line. Uh, the ma maternal line is, is, is uh, substantiated with, with this uh, connection, and so now we're really tempted to say that we've uh, used DNA to verify this family tree connection. 
But um, as usual, I would advise caution, even though the um, evidence looks very compelling, you want to leave no stone unturned. And so I, in this case, looked at one more thing. I, I looked at one more item. And in this case, um, I had the opportunity to compare Danny with my family and Danny's mom with my family. They're both on uh, 23andMe, so we had access to matching segment information for both of them at 23andMe. And as it turns out, Danny shares DNA with my family on chromosome 5, on chromosome 8, and on chromosome 17. And Danny's mother shares DNA with my family on chromosome 3 and chromosome 9. And for those of you who have had some experience with genetic genealogy, you're starting to see a problem here. Um, Danny is supposed to be connected to my family through his mother, but none of the matching segments are lining up at all with my family. He's um, matching my family on one set of chromosomes, and his mother is matching my family on another set of chromosomes, and there's nothing in common here. 5, 8, and 17, 3, and 9. So we have to conclude that the DNA that Danny shares with my family did not come from his mother. It all came from his father. So at this point, our DNA hint really falls apart. And whereas we were beginning to think that we had used DNA to verify this connection, uh, this connection is not DNA verified. The ancestral relationship is maternal, and the shared DNA is paternal, uh, so the DNA match with Danny does not verify the relationship pictured in this shared ancestor hint. So um, I just want to emphasize what I've said before. Um, it's easy to get the wrong impression until you've looked at every detail. So without matching segment details, you may think that you've reached some definite conclusions and that you verified uh, the ancestral relationship, but in fact, without the matching segment details, you may still be in a realm of DNA ambiguity. So you really want to get access to matching segment details if you can do it. Um, so let's talk about the other side of the coin. Uh, we did eventually find a paternal connection to explain the DNA that we share. And so we use matching segment details to generate family history success in this case. Uh, we started off with some incorrect um, information, and we ended up with, with new knowledge about our shared ancestry. So I'll talk about how we got from the point where we were looking at mysterious matching segment details and managed to turn that into family history success. Um, so this process of taking magic, uh, matching segment details and uh, generating uh, family history um, progress is really easier than it's ever been before. It was much harder when I first uh, started working with Danny to find our shared ancestry, but it's, it's now much easier because we have better, more powerful tools. The uh, databases are enormous, uh, several million at 23andMe, several million at Ancestry. Um, hard work is still necessary, but um, it, it's, it's, it's easier than it used to be. So the guiding consideration in this case where uh, Danny and I are looking for shared ancestry, uh, four, four years ago when uh, we first started communicating, Danny mentioned that he had, he thought there might be a potential connection with his Thurmond Terman lines, um, but it, I wasn't really sure about that. Um, and, Although I had uh, Thurman ancestry, my Thurman line encountered a hard brick wall before going far back enough to make any kind of convincing connection with Danny's lines. Uh, so although uh, my Thurman ancestor was from Elbert County, Georgia, and Danny's Thurman Terman lines were from the same county in Georgia, there wasn't a real clear connection there and uh, we were distracted by the DNA hint for a while, so we didn't pursue that aggressively. But when we found that the DNA that Danny shares with my family was actually from his father, uh, we, we renewed our investigation there. And of course, I was hoping to use DNA to make this more clear. And that's exactly what we did. 
And the tools that we used in this process included the 3D chromosome browser at GEDmatch, uh, the one-to-one -one comparison tool at GEDmatch, the tool called People Who Match One or Both of Two Kits at GEDmatch. Uh, that's a mouthful, but it's a very useful tool that I use all the time. And we also used the uh, 2D chromosome browser at GEDmatch. Um, in addition to that, we used information and resources at 23andMe to help us. So we'll go into that. And uh, these are the uh, intermediate to advanced super tools that we came here to talk about today. So the 3D chromosome browser, I think the very name of this tool intimidates a lot of people. And there are a lot of people out there who are doing advanced genetic genealogy who haven't really even looked at the 3D chromosome browser because the name might be a little bit misleading, but this is a very practical tool for genealogy, and I want to talk about uh, the 3D chromosome browser a little bit tonight so that I can show you how useful it is. So uh, the essence of the 3D chromosome browser is that it allows you to make multiple comparisons simultaneously and cut down on the amount of time that uh, you put into your research. Uh, you can um, get a lot of work done in a short period of time. So uh, when you find the link to the 3D chromosome browser at the main page at GEDmatch, you, click, you can click on that link and it takes you to this page where you're asked to enter in GEDmatch kit numbers for the people that you want to compare. And, um, and here I've, I've made some, um, some fake GEDmatch kit numbers, but this shows you what you do. You enter in uh, the GEDmatch kit numbers for the people that you want to compare. And we'll pretend that these are kit numbers for me and my siblings and that this is a kit number for Danny. And once you've entered in the kit numbers for the people that you want to compare, you click on display results and uh, you'll get this kind of presentation once you click on that display results. And, and this is part of what you get. This is, this is going to be near the top of the page uh, when you get your 3D chromosome browser results. And uh, this shows um, the amount of DNA, the genetic distance, the centimorgan shared uh, for Danny and my family. These numbers in red are numbers showing how much uh, the siblings and my family share with each other. And the numbers at the bottom are Danny. So Danny shares 41.4 centimorgans of DNA with me and 46.6 .6 with another sibling. And you can see with each sibling, he shares a different amount of DNA. Uh, here's the biggest number in the group. This is my sister. So she'll be the one that we use for our initial comparisons to get the process started, to get the analysis started. started. She shares the most DNA, so we'll start with her. So the next step um, in this process, uh, now that we've identified who we want to focus our attention on, we can do a one-to-one -one comparison. And so that's what we do here. We'll pretend that this is uh, my sister's number, and we'll pretend that this is uh, Danny's number and we can make a one-to-one -one comparison. You don't have to change or enter anything here in these other boxes. These default settings are excellent. There, there's no need to make any adjustments. So you just enter in a kit number here and enter in a kit number here and click submit and then the results of the one-to-one -one comparison um, you get um, matching segment details. Um, in this case we see that Danny and my sister share DNA on chromosome 5, and they share DNA on chromosome 17. You get start uh, locations, end locations, those are genetic coordinates. You get centimorgans, that's genetic distance. So uh, you get good information for each of the segments shared. And uh, we'll use this information to guide us as we go forward. So remember that Danny and my sister share DNA on chromosome 5, and they share DNA on chromosome 17. So uh, this takes us to my favorite tool at GEDmatch. This is a very powerful tool. It uh, gives you a lot of insights, and um, you can build on what you find in this tool to really power you forward and, and make amazing discoveries very quickly. Um, so we'll talk about that. So uh, if, you click, if you click on this link um, to take you to this tool, People Who Match One or Both of Two Kits, uh, you'll be taken to this form where you're asked to enter in the kit numbers. So uh, this is uh, this is Danny, and this is my sister, and these numbers are automatically um, available. I, I wouldn't make any changes there. 
Uh, those numbers are fine the way they are. And then you can click on display results and then you're taken to this display which shows you a long list of people who match Danny and my sister. All of these people share DNA with Danny and my sister. So these are certainly matches of interest in trying to find out what our shared ancestry might be. Um, so you have this column over here entitled select. You can click these boxes to select all or, or most of these matches and if you click the submit button um, then you're, you're taken to some other options. So I'll just remind you that this is a list of matches. You have kit numbers, you have DNA shared, you have email addresses. If you select multiple matches from this list, people who match uh, my sister and Danny, you can click submit and then you have some options for some tools that you can use to compare all of these people. And um, in this case, we're going to use the 2D chromosome browser. So we'll just click on this button and uh, then we have to click once more. And then we're taken to the 2D chromosome browser for, uh, for Danny's results uh, compared with um, my sister and, and their shared matches. So um, as, we, as we noted earlier, um, the key uh, information for the uh, comparison between Danny and my sister is on chromosome 5 and chromosome 17. So we could go, by, we could go chromosome by chromosome through the entire genome on uh, the 2D, 2D chromosome browser and, and look at everything but um, we can make progress more quickly if we focus on chromosome 5 and chromosome 17. So we made the one-to-one -one comparison earlier and that showed us that uh, the key information is on chromosome 5 and chromosome 17. So while we're in the 2D chromosome browser, we'll focus on those uh, chromosomes. And in fact, um, on chromosome 5, we find that we have a good number of, of interesting matches. Uh, Steve here shares 58, a 58 centimorgan segment with Danny, um, Evelyn 35, BJ 35, 43 centim centimorgan segment here. So some big segments, those, those are big segments and we're probably gonna get some interesting results from these big segments. Now, um, admittedly, this is a lot to take in, particularly if you're new to genetic genealogy. So uh, we'll focus in a little bit more closely. So uh, this column, uh, has names and GED match kit numbers, and this section has matching segment details, including uh, centimorgan values. So 58 centimorgans, there's a 58 centimorgan segment and a 9.7 uh, centimorgan segment, and you, you see the uh, genetic coordinates there. Uh, all of this is much more easily conceptualized if you just move down the page uh, you'll see a visual representation of, of what, um, what's presented here. So if you scroll down um, in the 2D chromosome browser, uh, you get all of the details and numbers, but you also get a nice picture to help you visualize and understand what's going on with this 2D chromosome browser. So here is match one. Um, that was Steve. Uh, match two was Evelyn. Match three was BJ. So you can see that these segments, we just had numbers uh, in the section above. Here we've, we have pictures and we can see very clearly that these segments overlap. These are overlapping segments as, uh, as compared to these segments off to the side that don't overlap and they're, and they're really not significant. So um, these overlapping segments suggest that there is shared ancestry. If two people or three people share a segment of D DNA located on the same chromosome in the same location on the same chromosome, then you know you're dealing with a situation where there's some shared ancestry. So this is the picture of shared ancestry. If you, if you see a big stack of matches, particularly if the stack has big segments, you, you know you're dealing with something interesting. Uh, the orange segments are, are big, uh, so are the yellow. They're, they're not quite as big as the orange ones. Green ones are of substantial size. So all of these segments are worth taking a look at. And, and you can see down below, these are the genetic coordinates. So this is a very easy way to see that you're dealing with an interesting set of matches 
um, and, and this could really get you somewhere. So remember, these stack matches uh, tend to match each other. Uh, they have shared genetic coordinates. You can do one-to-one -one comparisons or other comparisons to confirm that all of these people match each other. Uh, but I can tell you, when you arrive at the 3D chromosome browser through the process that I talked to you about here tonight, uh, the probability of all these people matching each other is quite high because all of these people uh, match both Danny and my sister. So there's already a common thread. When you get to the 3D, uh, when you get to the 2D chromosome browser through this process and you find a stack of matches, uh, you can uh, be fairly certain, even before you do the one-to-one -one comparison, that all of these people do match each other because they all do share some kind of uh, common ancestry. So uh, this takes us to the concept, mutual DNA reflects shared ancestry. And, and these, uh, these points are really the points that underline, underline the concept of triangulation which uh, you may hear about from time to time. Triangulation is a very powerful way of identifying shared ancestry by looking at shared DNA and focusing in specifically on shared DNA that uh, is in the same part of the genome. So likewise with chromosome 17, I mentioned that uh, Danny and my sister shared DNA on chromosome 17 and um, unsurprisingly, uh, there's a good group of matches um, Many of these are yellow, and so um, we can make similar assumptions about chromosome 17, um, sim similar to the uh, assumptions that we made about chromosome 5. So at this point, uh, you really get into the hard work. Uh, what, we've, what we've done up to this point can be done in just a few minutes or a few seconds. This, this, this takes us to the hard work. You want to get email addresses for each of these matches, and, and we had email addresses. Uh, if you go back, um, we had email addresses for each of these shared matches, um, and we had uh, GEDmatch kit numbers. Um, we also had GEDmatch kit numbers and names in the 2D chromosome browser. So you have contact information, you have kit numbers. Um, you can use that information to begin reaching out to these shared matches, particularly the ones that share the biggest segments, and um, you can begin to work towards finding shared ancestry. So you could even uh, Google some of these email addresses and find out something about these matches. Some of them will have trees, they'll be on uh, find a grave, they'll be elsewhere. Uh, you can enter in the kit, uh, kit numbers and the email addresses and the user lookup tool at GEDmatch and find out more about your matches. Um, you can uh, use the email addresses to guess ancestry usernames. Email addresses are often very similar to ancestry usernames, so you can use that as a way to try to find out who these people are and what their family trees might show. And of course you can make direct contact. Um, that's usually a little bit slower, but it, it, it may be the only way to get information from these people. So um, you can just reach out to these people and, and learn about their family history. So this is where the detective work comes in. This is why this uh, these results don't come instantly, and it's why it can take years to uh, gather all of this data, but uh, this is where you really m make your progress. So uh, we're going to zoom in on the uh, triangulation group that we saw earlier. This is a triangulation group because all of these people match each other. I, I can just confirm with you now that all of these people match each other. I've made the, the appropriate comparisons. So this is a triangulation group. And uh, after months and years of uh, making contact and um, learning about the family history of all of these matches, uh, of course, Danny is the person against whom the rest of us are being compared. Danny has Thurman ancestry from, from Georgia. Uh, number, match number two has Terman ancestry from Georgia. Uh, match number 15 has Terman ancestry from Georgia. Um, matches eight through 14 are my family, so certainly something very interesting going on here, and we can dig a little deeper as we go forward. So now that we have some matches of interest, particularly those that have the surnames that we're interested in, we can harvest the kit numbers 
that correspond with those matches. Remember, number two was a good one. Um, so we'll, we'll harvest the kit numbers that we're particularly interested in, and we'll go back to the uh, 3D chromosome browser, and we'll enter in those numbers, and we'll pretend like these are real numbers. You enter in the numbers of interest, and you go to display results, and in this case, uh, this is what I got for the people who were particularly interesting in the uh, chromosome 5 uh, triangulation group in this case. Um, I've modified uh, what uh, the 3D chromosome browser actually shows. I showed you an actual example earlier. This one's been modified for privacy and clarity, but um, this is what, um, these are the centimorgan values for each of, uh, of these uh, relationships. So uh, Danny shares 114 centimorgans with Brent, uh, a member of the triangulation group. Um, that's a very good match and it's likely to tell us something very interesting. Uh, likewise with Darcy, not quite as much, but still a very good match. And you can see that all of these people, or most of these people, um, share DNA um, in significant amounts. Uh, this is a uh, mother-son relationship, so obviously very close. This, these, these connections are not obvious just from the uh, lists that you get. Uh, when you put these people into the 3D chromosome browser, you get enough detail to really see how these things uh, fit together. And if you scroll down further in uh, the 3D chromosome browser results, uh, you go past the total amount of DNA shared and you get into the uh, matching segment details for individual segments. And as you can see, chromosome five, this is chromosome five. Uh, as you can see, chromosome five is a real hot spot for shared uh, DNA for this group of people, as we already knew, but now we, we have another way of looking at that information. And so, armed with this uh, good information, I was emboldened to do more research on my Thurman line. Uh, Sophia Thurman was the end of the line um, when I got started with this, uh, but I found sufficient paper trail evidence to support a connection here and, and found that uh, Sophia Thurman's father was Philip Thurman, and his parents were James Thurmond and Nancy Thurman. So I certainly would like more paper trail evidence, and eventually more paper trail evidence may come to light, uh, but I think the paper trail evidence is adequate. Uh, the DNA evidence propelled me to find this paper trail evidence, and the paper trail evidence in, com in, in combination with the DNA evidence um, really uh, makes me feel fairly confident about uh, this research, but there, there's more data to come, so we'll, we'll get into that. Um, this shows uh, data that, that we were looking at previously, and to that I have added data from 23andMe. So Danny is on 23andMe, and my family is on 23andMe, since we're both on 23andMe, we can look at what we have in common there. And in fact, we found some good matches to uh, add to the research that we've already done. In fact, um, this match, Debbie, is a very good match for my family. She shares 888 centimorgans with my family. And she, in fact, inspired me to uh, do this presentation to, to use uh, this a group of families for this presentation. I found her uh, just a week or two ago, and uh, she was not raised by a biological family, so uh, this was a pleasant surprise. We, we did not know that we had this close cousin. This is a new cousin for us, and as it turns out, she shares DNA with us on chromosome 5 um, on a line that's relevant to this thurmond uh research project. So very interesting match there, um, and that uh, compelled me to look further and look closer. Danny also had uh, a new match, Fritz. Uh, Fritz shares 482 centimorgans with Danny, and he also shares the uh, DNA on chromosome 5 that we're interested in. We, we already knew about Alma. Alma and Fritz are daughter and father. We knew about Alma uh, two or three years ago, but uh, she didn't know much about her family history, and we weren't really sure how she fit in, although we strongly suspected that she was an important part of this puzzle. Uh, when, when we finally got results for her father, 
um, he was able to give us some information that we could use to build his family tree, and it turns out he is a part of this puzzle. So a very strong match here, suggesting possibly a second cousin relationship, um, and that's actually what we found, and we'll talk about that some more. Um, these are the actual relationships. So uh, uh, in the previous slide, I was showing you the amount of DNA that each person shares with each of the other uh, persons of interest in this research project. Uh, this shows you the actual relationship that each person shares with everybody else in this group. And um, as you can see, some of the relationships are fairly close and some are more distant, but we have a good variety of relationships. I've worked out all of the relationships through building family trees and analyzing existing family trees. And so we have a really good network of connections here. And this shows uh, everything together at a glance. Um, we won't go through all of this right now, but you can see uh, with the closer relationships, such as third cousin or second cousin, uh, you're seeing larger amounts of DNA. And with more distant cousins, such as the sixth cousins, uh, sixth cousin connections in this group, uh, in some cases they don't share any date DNA at all. Uh, some of these I've listed as not applicable because some of these people are on uh, 23andMe, but they're not on GEDmatch, so I can't make direct, direct comparisons for everybody. Uh, but um, you can see we've, we've got some good connections here. And this is how it all fits together in a more familiar format. This is how all of these people are related to each other. This is our family tree. Uh, we're all descendants of George here, George Terman, and uh, most of us are descendants of his daughter, Nancy, but two of us are descendants of his son, John, and um, some of us are fairly closely related. As I mentioned earlier, my family uh, shares a first cousin once removed relationship with Debbie. Uh, Fritz and Danny are second cousins. We've got some third cousin relationships and more distant relationships, but uh, this is how everybody fits together. And so um, at this point, we can talk about the concept of walking back. Um, that this is a concept that uh, is described on the blog Segmentology. Um, I would encourage you to check out that blog. Um, it's a very uh, helpful blog if you're really interested in getting into the details of triangulation. But uh, this, is, this is the concept of walking back. Uh, several people share the same segment, and they share the same common ancestry by paper trail. Uh, we can assume that the common ancestor is the source of the shared DNA. So this, this is the concept of triangulation, mutual DNA, mutual ancestry. Um, if we find people who are related at different levels, as we, as we saw with the uh, family tree uh, that I showed you, if we find different levels of relationship, we can um, essentially walk the DNA back. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. So here's where we started. Um, we had my family, um, the Lees down in the corner on, on, the, on the left, and Danny, and um, our shared ancestor was identified as James Thurmond and Nancy Terman, and that's all we had. All of the rest of it uh, came later. Uh, we shared some DNA. We shared an ancestor. Uh, we, we could make a hypothesis, but it was a little bit too early to draw any conclusions. Then we got a match result with Lily. Uh, we actually found this match result through triangulation. Uh, Lily happened to be related to us through a more distant connection, but again, we all share DNA. Uh, we all happen to share a, a particular segment of DNA on chromosome five, and we shared a particular line of ancestry. So that uh, helped to strengthen our assumptions just a little bit more. And then uh, we found other shared uh, cousins who shared the same DNA on the same chromosome. These were closer cousins for Danny. Uh, they, these were third cousin relationships. They again shared DNA with the rest of the group and uh, they shared DNA particularly on chromosome five. So that helped to uh, reinforce the hypothesis a bit more. And we just continued to build as we went along. As I mentioned, um, last week I got a new result. That was Debbie, first cousin once removed. 
that connection was relevant to the line that connects uh, my family with these other families. And so that was a really exciting new match for a number of reasons. We kept working forward. Again, I mentioned Fritz was a new match. Fritz uh, is a close cousin, uh, second cousin with Danny, uh, relevant to these lines that we're researching, uh, shared uh, over 400 centimorgans with, with Danny, and also shares that uh, particular segment of interest with Danny on chromosome 5. And then uh, renewing previous research, we found Evelyn, yet another connection, um, a third cousin once removed with Lily. So uh, that uh, helped to uh, bring that line into focus. And then finally, uh, this is a match that I'm particularly proud of. Um, I found this match, Carmen, um, she, had a, um, she had a private tree and so I saw that we had a shared ancestor hint, um, but I couldn't see what the hint was. I did deduce that it would be relevant to this research, both on the uh, basis of uh, shared ancestors or uh, our shared matches list and uh, some other things that I, I looked at. And I, I wrote to her and I said, I think that I know how we're related, and I think that we share DNA on chromosome five. And she was very gracious uh, to uh, share her tree with me and to upload to GEDmatch. And we confirmed that she does share DNA on that segment on chromosome five. And uh, she is related to me as shown. So we can see how this walks back. You know, we're walking back to the shared ancestor. We started out with just Danny and my family and we had this distant connection, fifth cousin once removed. Uh, we didn't have a lot of other information to um, back up our assumptions, but over time we were walking back. Uh, so this is an intermediate, intermediate generation and another intermediate generation. And uh, you can see that we've uh, identified some intermediate common ancestors to help support the hypotheses that we've been investigating. And uh, this is just another, another way of looking at things. Uh, this is the same family tree. Um, we have actually identified three triangulation groups and these triangulation groups help us to show that this isn't just random DNA scattered across the genome, uh, possibly irrelevant to any uh, shared ancestor. We actually share DNA uh, on one particular segment on one particular chromosome. Uh, there are actually three examples of this. Uh, we've talked a lot about chromosome five, so you can see um, almost all of us share DNA on chromosome five on a particular segment. And that really helps to reinforce the idea that not only are we related, but we're all related uh, by one unifying ancestor who uh, gave us a segment of DNA that we all share. Uh, likewise, on chromosome 13, uh, three of these people uh, share DNA on one segment, on one chromosome, and uh, chromosome 17, as I mentioned earlier, ties uh, three of the families together. So um, very interesting way of looking at this information uh, to build a case where the paper trail is good, but is not as strong as we might like it to be. The, the DNA is, is helping to uh, illuminate the connections in a way that wouldn't be possible with any other approach. So just to summarize what we, we did here with Danny, we started out with an interesting match. Danny was our interesting match. And we compared my whole family with Danny using the 3D chromosome browser. That helped us to identify the best candidate for further research, and that was my sister who shared 51 centimorgans with Danny. So we took that, uh, we took those two people, my sister and Danny, to the one-to-one -one comparison tool and found the matching segment details, which told us that we would probably find our best information on chromosome 5 and chromosome 17. So we took Danny and my sister to the uh, people who match one or both of two kits tool 
and uh, we found shared matches through that process and took those shared matches through the 2D chromosome browser. And that help us, helped us to identify those large triangulation groups on chromosome 5 and chromosome 17. And that, in turn, helped us to identify shared ancestry with several other families. And we took the best matches from those triangulation groups. We took the matches whose ancestry is known to the uh, 3D chromosome browser to look at genetic distance and genetic coordinates. And that helped us to see how all of, all of these people were connected with each other. We could look at a large number of people all at one glance. And then ultimately, we integrated the DNA evidence with the paper trail evidence uh, to push this research to a new level. And I'll just close up with uh, this slide uh, to emphasize the fact that some of these people are in multiple databases. Uh, GEDmatch is the backbone of, of what we, we've been working on, um, but uh, there's data in other databases, and, and that data was very helpful. So just get your data out there so that we could do this 